Welcome to Mr. Brown's Basement, a channel devoted to sharing the craft of repairing, restoring, and modifying vintage electronic gear and other random stuff. Initially released in 1982 and sold throughout the 1980s, Nortel's display phone was meant to be the envy of business executives. Display phone is a two-line business phone, but a whole lot more. At the time, Nortel was attempting to combine voice services plus data services into one appliance, along with productivity applications such as a clock, calendar, scheduler, and so on. They thought this product was what the market really wanted. Perhaps the market did, but not at $895 in 1988, which would be about $1,900 today. Still, somewhere around 30,000 units were made, and Display Phone continues to be a collectible technological curiosity. There are several models for display phone. This one is the first Canadian model and the most basic. Mine was manufactured in 1985 and was followed up by a larger and more featured display phone plus, but I've never seen one in person. Let's take a look around my display phone. On the front, there's a keypad for selecting between the lines, for dialing numbers, redialing, and so on. There's volume control. A handset and that's it for voice features on top a seven inch black and white picture tube display underneath there's a full keyboard and that's for data services around the back there's a control for key tone the ringer volume receptacles for the two phone lines and here are ports different things that can be connected up to display phone. RS-232C was a protocol for sending one bit at a time to different devices such as other computers or printers. Parallel was a protocol for sending eight bits at a time to a printer. The power supply resides in this thing that looks like a brick. It was often nicknamed a brick. It contains a switching power supply outputting plus 5, plus 12, and minus 12 volts. Datafone contains two circuit boards. The top board manages voice services, port management, and the modem, while the bottom board manages data services. Most of the chips are 7400 series low power shot key, TTL, though there are some CMOS 4000 series and linear family chips as well. All the heavy lifting is done by LSI chips, including a CRT controller and an Intel 8085 microprocessor running at 3 MHz with 40 KB of ROM and 6 KB of static RAM. A full-function two-line telephone with hands-free and mute features and the ability to dial from memory. A data terminal with 40 or 80 column display ability to change duplex mode and parity, a 300 bit per second FSK modem, and a local RS-232 port, a phone or name directory of up to 81 entries, reminders, a clock calendar, and the ability to print, keypad for voice services, keyboard for data services, including control, break, and escape keys, a 7-inch black and white display, and volume and brightness controls. I'm dying to use this display phone, but there are a few things that need to be done. First of all, there's a rechargeable battery inside that keeps the clock going when display phone is off or disconnected. Today we use long-lasting non-rechargeable lithium batteries for preserving clock settings, but back then they used nickel cadmium or NICAD batteries. The batteries in this machine are not just dead, they're very dead. Dead NICADs, like any dead batteries, can corrode and do irreparable damage to whatever's nearby. I need to get the NICADs out. The next issue is a matter of the capacitors in this machine. Much equipment manufactured in the 1980s used safety capacitors made by a Swedish company called Rifa. Unfortunately, they had a paper dielectric inside, which over the years absorbs water, which becomes trapped. This may cause capacitors to suddenly explode. These vintage Rifa capacitors must be replaced with modern film capacitors. And the capacitors in question are located in the brick. Some display phone bricks are held together by screws. 
This assembly is just a matter of removing those screws, though sometimes stick-on feet must first be removed to expose the screw heads. This one isn't like that. This has plastic catches which have to be pushed to open. Here they are on top, and here they are underneath. You have to get in with a long tool and push these catches that way, and that will unclip what's holding it together over here. Ideally, you have three hands, or maybe even four, or a bunch of screwdrivers. With the top off, we can see it only has one reefer capacitor right there. 0.1 microfarad, and it's an X type, and it has to go. It's got electrolytic capacitors. They could be replaced. I'm not replacing them because they look okay. They're not bulging or anything. If the operation of this thing becomes unreliable, chances are the electrolytics will have to go. Also worthy of note is this regulating transistor. You can tell that it or the resistors around it got very, very warm, enough to, to brown the board. I noticed this power supply is made by Aztec. Uh, Aztec also made power supplies for Apple. It's worth checking those resistors, though. They're, they look like film resistors, so they'll probably be okay. I don't see a fuse. That's very unusual. Okay, no fuse. Is it really surprising that air could not get in here to keep the components cool? But it's not unusual, or it wasn't unusual, for function to be sacrificed for form. Steve Jobs was well, the master of that concept. Just look at the Apple III. But that is another story. Just waiting for the soldering iron to heat up so I can take out the reefer capacitor, which is right there. You can see how blackened the printed circuit board is from sustained heat. Normally a power supply like this would be dangerous to handle uh, because the capacitors would still be charged. But this power supply hasn't been on in goodness knows how long, so it's quite safe. The capacitor is out, and the capacitor is right over here. And you can see all the stress cracks in it. The new capacitor is on the left. Similar ratings, just a smaller package. I'm going to replace the capacitor and then put it back together, not fully back together, because I want to test the voltages. I think that I could acquire a 5 volt fan because there's plenty of current on the 5 volt rail and stick it in there. It's this heat sink which is getting really hot. Perhaps putting something in this corner here, either on this surface or on the, on the top surface. If I can get a fan with a small grill, I will put it in for sure. Otherwise, I'm going to put it back together now. I've got all the information I need in case I want to uh, do any service on it in the future. Now that I'm sure the power supply isn't going to have an explosion, I'm going to give it a test. I'll post the list of the capacitors in the power supply in the description in case you have a similar unit and you want to recap it. I'm going to have to read the manual, but it's definitely doing something, and it sure looks neat. To open up this unit, you have to stick something sharp or pointy in this teensy hole and push, and that will cause this to be released. The trick to opening it was pushing this in so it locked, and then using a tool, like a small screwdriver, to push until the rear cover is released. This piece here lifts up, revealing the picture tube. 
Then remove those two long screws from here and here. After taking off the monitor and the case top, I'm left with the motherboard and the battery is right there and it must be desoldered from below. It doesn't look terrible. There's no juice oozing out from the bottom as is sometimes the case. The other board is not held in place by any fasteners, just gravity. So it lifts out, though I will have to disconnect two ribbon cables and four spade lugs. And then the motherboard was released. When you take out the motherboard and flip it, there's another board attached underneath. Those are the ROMs. And uh, there's the RAM. There it is with the NICAD battery removed. I don't think at this point I'm going to find another battery solution. I'm just going to leave no battery there at all for now until I make a decision. Now I know how to get in and out of this machine. Here's the nickel cadmium battery. As you see, the date code is 8346, so late 1983. I'm very lucky that it hasn't begun to leak or corrode. Usually what you see is like a greenish color creeping down the leads onto the board and everywhere else. And that hasn't happened yet with this battery. This must go into hazardous waste. The power supply is definitely getting warm. The ambient temperature is about 25.3 degrees. The surface temperature of the power supply, while the unit is just standing by, the display phone isn't actually doing any work, is hmm, sort of slowing down now, 34.5. Yeah, it needs a fan. Should have had one all along. After tinkering with display phone for a while, it's my impression that it was designed as a data terminal tacked onto a telephone, rather than a telephone tacked onto a data terminal, or better yet, a telephone tacked onto a personal computer. For that reason, I think Northern Telecom got it completely wrong in the conceptual design of this office appliance. When considering the role of a business executive, the target market for this device, Northern Telecom forgot that executive functions are far more than just communications. But beyond communications, display phone is extremely limited. The user interface is clunky and frankly inferior to what was available for desktop computers at the time. More fundamentally is that they implemented this device as a data terminal when it should have been implemented as a personal computer because internally it is a computer, albeit one that is starved of RAM. In many ways, display phone is just a one trick pony, communication. And by the same token, it's an old dog to which you cannot teach new tricks because there are no ways for a user to upgrade or customize display phone software to their specific needs. I'm interested to read your take on display phone. Please leave your impressions in the comment section below. As a business machine goes, this must have been a very expensive one to manufacture at the time. After all, it has 113 chips, which is far more than other contemporary computers had yet display phone is far less versatile. And while it did cost less than a personal computer, the gap in price between it and a computer was not all that great. For the purpose of argument, let's compare display phone to a full-fledged computer that was manufactured and sold at the same time, the Apple IIc. Except for the obvious lack of a handset, there are striking similarities in form factor and what is actually under the hood. Two similar products, one not that significantly more expensive for the target market, and one which has considerably more hardware, able to do much less. That's a recipe for a product that the market will drive to extinction.
and it did. The first thing I'd like to do is upgrade the firmware, which means removing the five EEPROMs and burning a new set with more recent firmware. Then I'd like to open up the power supply again and put in a small 5 volt fan so that it just won't get so hot, especially when it's not doing anything. I'll probably install a non-rechargeable battery for preserving the settings when display phone is off. It will probably require also installing a diode to prevent the battery charging circuit from working. Finally, I'd like to make another video showing display phone in operation looking as it would have looked in the 1980s, except with no ridiculous hairdos or atrocious clothing. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider giving me a thumbs up and subscribing to Mr. Brown's Basement for more interesting and unusual videos.